New Grub Street by George Gissing, dramatised by Tony Ramsey, with Harold Pinter as the narrator. Episode 2. With the failure of his last novel, Edwin Reardon was only too aware that financial catastrophe was silently bearing down on him like a ship in the night. However, in the weeks that followed the book's publication, he clung to the lifeline of his daily routine at the desk. The coldness that had entered his relationship with his wife, Amy, prevented her asking what he did there, and he did not choose to tell her. On the contrary, as the new work progressed, he derived some strange pleasure from the fact she knew nothing of this last attempt to avert the disaster of their possible separation. Am I disturbing you? No, I won't do any more tonight. What is it? Edwin, we must decide what we are to do. I was under the impression you had decided already. We cannot put this off any longer. If we do nothing, what little money we have will soon be gone. So, we are to give up the lease, store our furniture, and while you take William to your mother's, I am to be dispatched to some seaside garret. To write the book that will restore your reputation, yes. I promise you I do not welcome the prospect either. It may not be necessary. And why not? Here. I have taken your advice, yours and Jasper's. A new book? I have written a sensation story in a single volume. I have ignored the demands of the novelist Edwin Reardon and considered only the demands of the market. Here is the result. How much is it worth, do you think? <laughs> Heavens, don't ask me that. Well, then how much can you expect? I have no idea. Markland got 200. I can't believe we'll get that. But they can hardly give us less than the 75 we got for Margaret home. Enough to keep us here? I believe so. These last three weeks, barely a kind word has passed between us. You've hardly seen your son. I'm sorry if I've been too busy to give you the attention I might otherwise have done, but writing under these conditions is no easy task. No doubt you'd find it easier if we were not here. That's not what I meant. <sighs> Amy! I have to see to William. You have no pupils at all. I had to let them go. There were only two in any case. The book is taking all my time. But how on earth do you live, Biffin? I manage. I think I do not eat as much as most. You're making yourself ill. Oh, I don't think so. But the work progresses. Oh, do you know, it's a good deal more difficult than people imagine to write of insignificant things. It has cost me countless hours to produce a mere half page. And yet you work at it still. Oh, no one has attempted such a thing before. Whether I succeed is not the point. I must try. Biffin, do you despise me? My dear fellow, how could you ask such a thing? Well, here you are, doing what any artist should do. Writing for no other reason than not writing is an impossibility. And here I am, like countless others, manufacturing stuff by the yard for mere financial gain. But you are not one of these countless others. They cannot choose to write anything else. You can. No, you believe you are talking to a man who can choose to write something better. I do not think so. Not anymore. I believe I am discussing literature with the same Edwin Reardon who wrote On Neutral Ground. He has not gone away. No. And I think he's in the farthest corner of Siberia. Will it buy you some breathing space? Some. But whether it will be enough, I can't tell. It may be that I'm condemned to write trash for the rest of my career. I do not think you have a talent for trash. <laughs> Don't say that, Biffin. Just now, my life depends upon it. Edwin, there's a letter from Jedwood. So, we are to find out our fate at last, are we? Won't you open it? How much have they offered? Edwin? See for yourself. We regret the story does not seem likely to please the particular public to whom our new series of novels is designed to appeal. They've turned you down. It's rejected, yes. It doesn't surprise me. The thing's too empty to please the better kind of reader and not vulgar enough to please the worse. You'll try somewhere else? There's no point. So, that puts paid to your plan. I won't be summering in a Brighton garret. But you have to. I cannot. We do not have the means. Then we must sell the furniture. The furniture? Do you want rid of me at any price? Please don't begin that over again. If we sell the furniture, it means we'll never be together again. I have no wish to desert you, Edwin. 
I want you to go away and work for us all so that we can be together again as we were before. You must see that. Have you been out today? This morning, yes. Why? Did you see anyone? No. Biffin says he saw you in Tottenham Court Road with Jasper Milvane. I exchanged a word with him. And did not tell me. What are you saying? Why do you ask me this? No, no reason. I merely find it odd that you cannot recall meeting someone you'd seen barely an hour ago, but no matter, we must sell the furniture then. Oh, you must do as you think fit. Wait, where are you going? To see my mother. There is a good deal to arrange. Even at this late stage, Reardon might have averted disaster. But his better self was ruled by feelings of anger and injustice. In his vulnerable state, he held Amy obscurely responsible for his publisher's rejection. Had she not, at Milvane's prompting, urged him to write the wretched book? And was it not her plain duty to support his wishes now the thing had failed? Such questions proved insurmountable. And in an agony of spirit, he began to make preparations for the coming separation. Reardon, how the devil are you? Why haven't we seen you? You promised to bring that delightful wife of yours round. Oh, sorry, Carter, I've been a little occupied. Work has been taking up a good deal of my time. Ooh, well, you need a holiday. That's what you need. Get up to Scotland, do a bit of boating and fishing. A winter in London tires a man. No, I don't think I should travel as far as that, but I may be going away for a short while. To Brighton. Oh, good for you. The sea air will do you the world of good. Oh, have you heard? We're opening a new branch of the hospital in the city road. No. No, I didn't know. Only for outpatients, of course. Open for three mornings and three evenings alternately. Who will represent you there? Well, I shall look in now and then, of course. There'll be a clerk, like at the old place. Have you engaged anyone? Oh, not yet, though I think I know a man who'll suit. Carter, you wouldn't be disposed to give me the chance. <laughs> well, I'm afraid you're rather above my figure these days, old man. Well, what will you pay? A pound a week still? Twenty-five shillings. I'm serious. Reardon. What the deuce do you mean? I mean it. No, the, the fact is, we artists need variety in our occupation. There's something to take us away from our writing for part of the time. You know I'm equal to the job. You can trust me. And I dare say I shall be more useful to you than most clerks. I'm floored. I, I shouldn't have thought... But, but of course, if you really want it... When shall I begin? The place will be open tomorrow week, but how about your holiday? Oh, that can wait. A change is all I need. This will do just as well. Well, it's a comical idea, but you know your business best, I suppose. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. You won't regret it, I promise. <laughs> Mother advises us not to sell furniture. Good. I had quite made up my mind not to do so. Has something happened? I bumped into Carter. They're opening an outpatient department of the hospital in the city road. He needs someone to help him there. I asked him for the post. The post? What post? The clerkship. It'll be the same work as I used to have, registering patients, receiving their letters and so on. The pay is to be five and twenty shillings a week. Is this a joke? <laughs> Far from it. It's a blessed deliverance. You have asked Mr Carter to take you back as a clerk. I have. And you propose that we shall live on 25 shillings a week? No, no, I shall be engaged on only three mornings and three evenings. In my free time, I can pursue my literary work. No doubt I can earn £50 a year by it. Tomorrow I shall go and look for rooms in Islington. We have been living far beyond our means. That must come to an end. In time, things might change, but for the present, we are poor people and we must live in a poor way. Our friends must just take us as we are. I shall not consent to this. In that case, I must do without your consent. The rooms will be taken and our furniture transferred to them. That will make no difference. I have decided, as we agreed, to go to Mother's with William. You, of course, must do as you please. I should have thought a summer at the seaside would have been more helpful to you, but if you prefer to live in Islington... Amy, are you my wife or not? I am not the wife of a clerk who is paid so much a week. You would be more ashamed to share your husband's misfortune than to declare to everyone you had deserted him. I shall tell everyone the simple truth. You have the opportunity of making one more effort to save us from degradation. You refuse to take it. Amy, listen to me. When I talked of leaving you and going away to work in solitude, I was foolish and insincere. I knew that I was undertaking the impossible. I was just 
putting off the inevitable day when I was going to have to admit that I can't live by literature. All you have done in these last months is to toil away in illness and anxiety. Now a chance is offered to you to spend a summer working in another way. Till that is tried, you have no right to give up all for a clerkship and drag me down with you. You surely know how people of my world would regard that. Of your world? I had thought that your world was the same as mine. I don't wish to speak of this anymore. Amy! If you don't talk to me now, then nothing can keep us together. Go and see Mr Carter. Tell him you made a terrible mistake, and afterwards I will talk as much as you like. Dear God, if my opinions count for so little, you should put an advertisement in the newspapers, as men do, about their wives' debts. Make it known that I have brought disgrace upon myself and you're in no way connected with it. Why not? That way your friends will know you've been wronged. I have said what I will do. I can't stultify myself to please you. Very well. Then you must go your way and I will go mine. Is this how we part, then? The choice is yours, Edwin. Entirely yours. Ah! Read it! A minute or two and I should have missed you, I see. There are things I have to attend to, as I'm sure you are aware. Are you obliged to go at once, or...? Could I have a word with you? Come in. Thank you. Cigarette? Uh, thank you, no. You're on the point of moving, I see. Uh, yes, I am. You'll let Amy know your new address? Mm, certainly. Why on earth should I conceal it? Well, I thought you might be taking it for granted that the rupture was final. Please tell me, do you come on Amy's behalf? In a way. She hasn't sent me, but my mother and I are so astonished at what has happened, we felt it was necessary for one of us to see you. I think difficulties between husband and wife are generally best left to themselves. But really, Reardon, do you tell me, in all seriousness, you expect Amy to live on a pound a week? I offer her the best home I can. She chooses not to accept. Then you see no reason why she shouldn't live as at present for an indefinite time. I can only say that as soon as I can afford a decent home, I shall give my wife the opportunity of returning to me. But when is that likely to be? I refuse to discuss this with you further. You are utterly unable to comprehend me and my position. You must take whatever view seems natural to you. I have no intention of quarrelling with you, Reardon. I'll just say that as I take a share in the expenses of my mother's house, this question decidedly concerns me. And I should add that it ought to concern you a good deal more than it seems to. You have expressed yourself very clearly. And I shall endeavour to address the problem at once. Is there anything else you wish to say? Thank you. I think not. Then I wish you good day. Dear Amy, enclosed in this envelope you will find £20. I have been reminded that your relatives will be at the expense of your support. It seemed best for me to sell the furniture at once. As soon as I begin to have my payment from my clerkship with Carter, half of it shall be sent to you every week. My address is 5 Manville Street, Upper Street, Islington. Edwin Reardon. Dear Edwin, as you have sold the furniture, I shall accept half this money that you send. I must buy clothing for myself and William, but the other ten pounds I shall return to you as soon as possible. As for your offer of half what you are to receive from Mr. Carter, that seems to me ridiculous. In any case, I cannot take it. If you seriously abandon all further hope from literature, I think it is your duty to make every effort to obtain a position suitable to a man of your education. Amy Reardon. Dear Amy, the money is for your support as far as it will go. If it comes back to me, I shall send it again. If you refuse to make use of it, you will have the kindness to put it aside and consider it as belonging to William. The other money which I spoke of will be sent to you once a month. As our concerns are no longer between us alone, I must protect myself against anyone who would be likely to accuse me of not giving you what I could afford. For your advice, I thank you. But remember that in withdrawing your affection, you have lost all right to offer me your counsel. Edwin Reardon. Reardon! Uh, Reardon, wait! I've been hoping to run into you. I hear you've moved. Uh, to Islington, yes. Why didn't you tell me? I don't even have your address. No, I'm not entertaining visitors. Excuse me. Reardon! Is there something amiss between us? There is something amiss between me and everyone. 
You mustn't be so gloomy. Come to my rooms and let's see if we can't talk more in the old way. Your way of talk isn't much to my taste, Milvane. It has cost me too much. Cost you too much? I don't understand. Your way of talking has always been to glorify success. To insist it's the one end a man must keep in view. If you talked to me alone, it wouldn't have mattered, but there was generally someone else present. But, but who? My wife. Your words had their effect, I can see that now. It's very much owing to you that I am deserted now that there's no hope of my ever succeeding. That's the most astonishing thing to say. Of course, I, I know nothing of what has passed between you and your wife, but... I feel certain I have nothing more to do with what has happened than any other of your friends. You may feel as certain as you like, but your words and your example have influenced my wife against me. I don't suppose you intended it for a moment. It's my misfortune. That's all. Of course I didn't intend it. But if your wife has grown unkind because of your misfortune, there's no need to examine other people's influence for an explanation. You regard my wife as someone who shares your own opinions about the expediency of marriage? A woman likely to fail me in time of need? Really? If we are not to talk with the old friendliness, it's far better we shouldn't discuss things such as this. You choose not to answer, I see. Then you will allow me to draw my own conclusions. You don't surely think this extraordinary influence of mine is still being used against you? I know nothing at all. How can I? I have not seen Amy. Very well. Henceforth, I shall keep away from her altogether. You shan't have to fear I'm decrying you. My God, what an amiable figure you make of me. No, I'm sorry if I've said what I shouldn't, but my condition requires it. Ridden, <sighs> why don't you talk to Amy? See if you can't... Thank you, but I must judge of my own affairs. <sighs> Very well. Then I beg your pardon. Wish you good night. And good night. If you would care to, I could show you a chapter of Mr. Bailey. I would value your opinion. I'm not sure it would be worth much just now, Biffin. On the contrary, it would be worth a great deal. Biffin, you have been my one true friend in all this business. Don't say that. Why not? My family has deserted me. I think you are too harsh on Amy. I really don't see how she could have acted otherwise. It was a hard and miserable thing that she should have to leave you for a time, and you couldn't face it in a just spirit. Don't you think there is some truth in this way of looking at it? I did not ask more than she was capable of. I believed she was made of finer stuff. I suppose there were faults of temper on both sides. You saw each other's weaknesses, that's all. I saw the truth which had always been disguised from me. You must forgive me, Reardon, but I cannot believe that. Any more than I believe your parting is permanent. And whether or not it is permanent remains to be seen. Something has happened. I saw Carter today. He has offered me a new post. A house. Rooms, at least. And 150 a year. Oh, but that's wonderful news. It's the secretaryship of a home for destitute boys in Croydon. You will ask Amy to go with you? I expect so. Though I can't see her taking to life in Croydon, she will probably refuse. You misjudge her, Reardon. You mustn't lose this chance of setting everything right again. Go and see her. Tomorrow. I shall write to her. Go and see her. No good ever came of letter-writing between two people who have misunderstood each other. The happiness of your life depends on what you do now. Be content to forget whatever wrong has been done to you. But to think that a man should need persuading to win back such a wife. Biffin. Go. I implore you. Dear Amy, I have a reason for wishing to see you. Will you have the kindness to appoint an hour on Sunday morning when I can speak with you in private? It must be understood that I shall see no one else. Edwin Reardon. Do you know why I have come? I think so. Then the Carters have told you about the new position? Yes. 
It doesn't interest you at all. I am glad to hear that you have better prospects. You speak as if it in no way concerned you. Is that what you wish me to understand? Wouldn't it be better if you tell me why you were here? I came to ask you what you propose to do in case I go to Croydon. I have no proposal whatever. Then you are content to go on living here? If I have no choice, I must make myself content. But you have a choice. None has been offered to me yet. Then I offer it now. I shall have a dwelling, rent-free, and £150 a year. You can either accept half this money in the same way you have done for my present post, or come and take your place again as my wife. Please to decide what you will do. I will let you know by letter in a few days. I must know at once. I can't answer at once. If you don't, I shall understand you to mean that you refuse. You know the circumstances. There is no reason why you should consult with anyone else. You can answer me immediately if you will. I do not wish to answer you immediately. Then when I leave this room we are strangers to each other. There was never a time when I could have resisted a word from you. Edwin, please. Have you any love for me left? Is there even so small a hope that I might win some love from you again? You are very much changed. No, Amy. I am the man I always was. The man you once loved. Very well. If you wish me to come and live with you when you go to Croydon, I will. That is no answer, Amy. It is all I can say. You mean you are prepared to sacrifice yourself out of pity? I can't say anything except that I will come to Croydon if you wish it. I will not have you dragging out a weary life with me. Either you are my willing wife, or you are nothing to me. I am married to you. I repeat, I shan't refuse to obey. No, Amy. If our married life is ever to begin again, it must be of your seeking. Come to me of your own will and I shall never reject you. But I will die in utter loneliness rather than ask you again. Do you know, Biffin, today at work I was almost content. I regretted nothing and wished for nothing. Then you are in a morbid state of mind. I don't think so. There was a girl. She came up to my desk, poorly dressed, tall, good-looking, very quiet. I thought, this is the kind of girl I should have married. Not someone like Amy. You are deceiving yourself. But why? Some kind-hearted work girl would have been the kind of wife that suited my circumstances. If I'd earned a hundred a year, she'd have thought we were rich. I could have taught her about the finer things in life, things her station would have denied her. And we would have been poor but happy. What a shameless idealist you are, Reardon. The girl would only have married you on the assumption you were a gentleman in temporary difficulties. When she discovered there was to be no money after all, she would have grown sharp-tongued, querulous and selfish. Every attempt at educating her would have widened the gulf between you. In the end, you would have either sunk to her level or abandoned her. It has happened a thousand times. I'd have had a better chance of happiness than I did with Amy. Your marriage was sensible enough, and a few years hence you will be happy again. You seriously think Amy will come back to me? Of course I do. I'm not sure that I even desire it. There. I told you you were in a strangely unhealthy state. But don't you think it the best thing that can happen to a man if he outgrows his passion? If he can be a free spirit, utterly remote from the temptations and harassings of sexual emotion? What we call love is merely turmoil. Who wouldn't release himself from it if the possibility offered? Oh, there's a good deal to be said for that. I remember a sunset one night in Greece. I was in Athens and had been wandering about for an hour or more as the sun went down. The Gulf of Aegina was all golden mist, the islands floating in it vaguely. To the right, over black Salamis, lay delicate strips of pale blue, indescribably pale and delicate. You remember it very clearly, as if I saw it now. And as I turned eastwards, to my astonishment, I saw a magnificent rainbow. A perfect circle stretching from Parnese to Hymettus, 
framing Athens and its hills. I believe it was the happiest moment of my life. Live in hope, Biffin. Scrape together 20 pounds and go there if you die of hunger afterwards. I shall never have 20 shillings. I feel sure you will sell Mr. Bailey. That's kind of you. But if Mr. Bailey is ever sold, I don't mind undertaking to eat my duplicate of the proofs. <laughs> <laughs> In episode two of New Grub Street by George Gissing, the narrator was Harold Pinter. Edwin Reardon was played by Jonathan Firth. Amy Reardon by Amelia Fox. Jasper Milvane by Jonathan Cake. Mr. Yule by Kenneth Cranham. And Marion Yule by Tracy Ann Oberman. Anne Beach was Mrs. Yule. Helen Longworth, Dora. Ian Masters, Biffin. David Timpson, Quamby. Martin Hyder, Mr. Carter, Gemma Churchill, Amy's mother, and Carl Prekop, John. New Grub Street was dramatized by Tony Ramsey, with music by Mia Soteriu, and directed by Janet Whitaker. <laughs>